Well, it's great to be with you. Uh, and I uh, want to thank you for participating. Uh, I'm delighted to have Jay Apolofia, who's a financial planner, uses uh, Maxify Planner in his, uh, in his uh, practice. He's the, uh, as Alex indicated, founder of Lion Financial Planning. They're located in Waltham, Mass. So they, he directly serve, helps people in the Boston metropolitan area, but uh, you can also engage with him long distance by whatever Zoom, uh, uh, regardless of where you uh, find yourself. Uh, today, uh, I'm gonna start out telling you about uh, inflation and uh, then talk about the economy and, and talk about uh, the prospects for recession and then talk about whether uh, we really understand how much people are getting hurt by inflation. It's much uh, greater than I think most people understand, unless in terms of the broad picture, uh, although people are feeling this, understand it very well personally. But anyway, let me uh, start with the picture about inflation. The, this is a, a chart of the uh, inflation rate for the prior 12 months. So if you look at uh, this chart, it's saying, if you look, for example, at a given year and a given month, we're looking at uh, what the inflation rate was over the prior 12 months. So that's a retrospective picture of inflation. And you see two uh, curves here. The uh, gray line here is, is what's called uh, overall or uh, just the total inflation rate. The uh, core inflation rate, the, the orange yellow line is the overall inflation, except it leaves out uh, energy price increases and food price increases, which are quite volatile. So what we're seeing here is that uh, clearly in the 1980s, we had very high inflation all the way up to 15%, but it's really kicked way up in recent uh, months in the last year to uh, you know 8% uh, on a retrospective basis. If you go back to like June, it was around 8.8% uh, 8, 8 .8 for the prior 12 months. The core inflation has been lower. That's uh, viewed as good news uh, because that's basically more stable uh, measure as you can see the core inflation rate is basically running in between the uh, the, the uh, gray curve. Now, where things, uh, where exactly have been things over the last 12 months? If you go back to June, you look back to the prior June, the inflation rate over that period, well, it wasn't 8.8, it was 9.1%, really high, something we haven't seen for really uh, a long, long time. And then October, it was still very high, 7.7%. Again, looking back 12 months. Just last month, it was 7.1% looking back 12 months. So you got to, you know, so from that perspective, it seems like inflation is still extremely high uh, and will remain that, remain potentially remain very high going forward. If you look at core inflation, things look better, but we're talking about roughly a 6% inflation rate that's been pretty stable going back the prior 12 months from last June through uh, just last month. Seems like no improvement, like we're stuck with 6% inflation. On the other hand, if you look at uh, the, the future, not the past, which is what really we worry about, uh, then we want to look at monthly inflation rates, not the prior 12-month inflation over all the 12 months in the in the prior uh, year. So the monthly inflation is telling us a little bit more about the future, whereas the annual inflation rate is telling us about the past. And what's the story for the overall monthly inflation rate? Well, in June, it was 1.3%, quite high. In October, it was 0.4%, and November was 0.1%. So you can see it's come down dramatically. So a lot of what's going on with respect to annual inflation is that um, the uh, 
uh, is it's looking at uh, months in the past where inflation, where the monthly inflation rate was quite high, but now we're seeing the monthly inflation rate coming down quite dramatically. Whether that's going to uh, maintain itself, don't know. You see the core inflation rate also coming down to uh, something quite quite low. The, the markets um, are predicting about a 2.5% inflation rate over the next five years. And then over, over really 30 years, it's about a 2.5% inflation rate. If you look at the difference between the 30-year uh, regular treasury bond rate and the 30-year TIPS uh, bond rate, which is the inflation index bond rate, the differential is telling you about what the market predicts inflation to be, and that's about uh, 2.5%. So, but it's also, if you look at, make that comparison now just five years, you're also getting 2.5%. So the, certainly the financial markets think inflation is a temporary phenomenon, that it's a phenomenon, that it's a phenomenon, that it's a really just a reflection of supply shot, side shocks that were largely temporary. And you see this in, uh, in oil, the price of gas uh, or oil, let's think about oil. When Putin invaded back at the end of February last year, the price of oil shot way up and then it came down and it's actually lower today than it was when he invaded. The price of wheat uh, shot way up. It's lower today than when he invaded. Not much lower, so it's roughly the same as when he invaded. So, so you see that there is a supply side response to supply side shocks. Uh, Ukraine, the loss of uh, grain from Ukraine, everybody said it was going to be a lead to a disastrous uh, increases in prices of, of grain, but nobody really checked whether the fact that Ukraine only produced about eight. I think they're the eighth largest producer of wheat. I'm not. It's, it's not that I think I know. They're the eighth largest producer of wheat. China is the largest producer. The U.S. is the second largest. So no doubt, back six months ago, a lot of U.S. farmers were producing, were planting a lot of wheat, and that stuff has come onto the market now, now that it's been harvested, and that's brought the price down. So. Uh, this is just showing you the resiliency of the world economy to respond to supply sh side shocks. Now, what's happened to the real economy? Well, here you see the unemployment rate. Under COVID, it went way up, but uh, now it's down to basically 3.7% a, a is the latest number, and that's uh, pretty close to the post-war low. So based on unemployment, the economy doesn't look anything like a recession. It's doing great guns. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's stayed low, come down and stayed low during this uh, increase in prices during this inflation. What about total employment? Well, here we see this long-term trend uh, of a decline in employment. This has, has, I think, a bunch to do with demographics as well as some change in labor force participation. You see a big uh, uh, increase before, um, uh, well, at the time that uh, we saw a big decline, well, we saw an increase after, uh, I guess, COVID, and then it's uh, come back down. I'm not sure what exactly caused that spike of total employment to go up, but um, uh, it must have been people just coming back to work for a bit, but, uh, we're, we're down to um, uh, you know pretty low level of total employment these days. Now here's the uh, employment to population ratio. This is also pretty interesting. It it dropped uh, right when when COVID hit, and then it came back. So the uh, but it didn't come back to as to as much as it it was before COVID hit. So we have a a, a lower employment to population ratio than we had before. And that is about two percentage points, two and a half percentage points. So when we see all these uh, help wanted uh, ads or, or signs in, in stores, it, it reflects the fact that that uh, there's just not that many people available to work 
And that comes back to this chart right here that the employment to population ratio is lower than it was at the beginning of COVID. Now, here's an interesting chart. This is the share of the population 65 and older. If you go back to 2010, just about 12 years ago, it's just 13%. Today, it's 22%. It's an enormous change uh, uh, in the demographics. We've had just an enormous increase in the share of the elderly in the population. Uh, here's another chart that I think you should all be aware of, which is what's happened to real median weekly wages. This stat is coming from, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So from the time COVID uh, began to, uh, to today, and this is really a reflection of inflation, real wages have dropped 8%. For typical U.S. workers, dropped 8%. That's a really shocking decline. It takes, you know, productivity growth in the U.S. is about 1%. So this is wiping out about, and then of course it compounds. But so this is wiping out about out about six years of productivity growth just in the, in the, the past two years because of inflation. So what's what this is saying is that prices have gone up, but wages have not kept pace and people were poorer and they've either called it quits or they've retired or uh, and some people are just work you know working to try and make maybe two or three jobs to maintain the living standard but this is real real damage that is not going to be reversed necessarily if inflation comes to an end. If, in, if inflation continues, things could actually get worse on this front. And it's not just workers, but um, but older people as well, as Jay's going to point out in his presentation. Uh, the bottom line here is that monthly inflation is rapidly falling. The recent inflation has hurt. That's, you know, the good news is the monthly inflation rate is falling. We're hoping that it will stay low, that the annual inflation going back 12 months from, let's say, next April is much lower than it is going back 12 months from, from today. But the inflation is hurt. If you think about Detroit uh, retired policemen who lost 40 cents on the dollar when Detroit went bankrupt, and then they were handed a pension Rather than handing nothing, they were handed a pension that was fixed in nominal terms with no inflation adjustment, from what I understand. I may have that wrong, but that's my understanding. And what that means is that their real incomes have dropped by the cumulative amount by which prices have risen, probably 12% or so by at this point. So they've really been hurt. Uh, another group, of course, is the workers I just mentioned, general workers. But... The elderly, too, uh, are getting hurt because if they're earning asset income, capital gains or interest income, the U.S. tax code taxes uh, taxes nominal income, asset income. It's not, in, it's not adjusted for inflation. It's not indexed for inflation. Some parts of the federal income tax are adjusted for inflation, but the asset income side is not adjusted at all, nor are the thresholds beyond which Social Security benefits are become taxable first 50% and then 85% of your Social Security benefits are subject to federal income taxation. Those thresholds are not indexed for inflation. And then you have several states, about 12, I believe, who also tax your Social Security benefits. So you can get double whammy there. And then there's also the ceiling on Medicare Part B premiums, the top ceiling is not indexed to inflation. So if inflation's uh, high enough for long enough, everybody will be paying the top Medicare Part B premium because with inflation, nominal wages go, uh, what go up, even if they don't go up as fast as prices. Asset incomes go up nominal terms because uh, interest rates go up to adjust for the fact that you get paid back in watered down dollars. Social Security benefits are increased because of COLAs. And all these things mean that it looks like you have more income, but you don't actually have more income once you take into account 
uh, the price increase. In real terms, you don't have more income, but your real taxes go up by, still go up. And uh, that's because the whole fiscal system is not fully indexed for inflation. And then, of course, you also have employers who are not keeping their wages up in real terms. So I think uh, the government needs to, the president needs to be addressing with employers what they're doing to the workers. I mean, cutting real wages by 8%, letting real wages drop by 8% in this tight economy, that's, um, that to me is some level of immor immor immorality. Uh, that's just indecent. So let me uh, move to the last issue, which is are we heading to a recession? Uh, if you go back to last June, uh, the JP Morgan CEO, JP Morgan is the largest bank in the world. Jamie Dimon is the CEO. He's been the CEO for quite a while. He's not JP Morgan who started J JP Morgan, but he's among the bankers of the world, the top banker, if you like. He's the most prestigious. He's got the largest bank. So what he says matters. Last June, he goes on the tube and he says, that an economic hurricane is coming. They asked him how big was the hurricane and when it was coming, he said, well, it could be Hurricane Sandy, but it could also be smaller. And I don't know for sure, but it's coming. Okay, so that's to me an incredibly irresponsible statement from somebody who's supposed to be a grown up. Then we have Lawrence Summers, the former uh, Secretary of Treasury under Obama, who just a couple months ago said recession is almost inevitable. That's his pronouncement. He's been pushing Chairman Powell of the Fed to raise interest rates dramatically. Uh, and inter real interest rates that the Fed has set, the federal funds rate, is running around 0% right now. So the Fed has raised interest rates, but inflation has also been high. So the real federal funds rate is only zero. Under Volcker, when we had high inflation, Volcker let the real federal funds rate go up by to three percentage points. So the real rate under Volcker uh, at the peak of inflation was 3% real. Under Powell, it's 0%. Summers is pushing Powell to make it 3%. He went, he's saying he'd like to drive, we should be driving the economy down the tubes to uh, stymie inflation. Now he's looking like he has mud on his face because monthly inflation's come down. So I don't know what his latest statement will be, but uh, he certainly can't be predicting a recession being almost inevitable uh, because the Fed is going to moderate their their federal funds rate increase, I'm sure, in light of the re recent news. Then we have Goldman Sachs' CEO, David Solomon, in October saying there's a good chance of recession. Let me tell you what Goldman Sachs is now predicting for the U.S. economy in 2023, a 1.0% growth. So that we're talking about two months later, Goldman is, is predicting not negative growth, but positive growth. For a recession to happen, you have to have two quarters of negative growth and some other things uh, that look like recessions. It's, it's kind of a value judgment that the National Bureau of Economic Research that's located in Cambridge. It's, a co it's basically a clubhouse of economists and uh, uh, they decide uh, when we're actually in recession, when we're out of recession, and a group of macroeconomists there get together and make that call. But generally, uh, criteria is that we have two quarters of negative growth. We had that in, 20, in the early part of 2022, but the, but the MBR economists did not call that a recession because the unemployment was so low and, and employment growth was so high. But anyway, here we have uh, Goldman, you know, the, the chairman says two months ago, we're gonna have a recession. Pretty likely what that means is probably more than 50%, maybe 66%, two thirds percent chance. And now they're saying we're gonna have positive growth and that it's gonna be uh, even higher in 2024, 1.6, 1.9 this year, even though part of this year was negative growth. So. What does all this mean? The lesson is that inflation, the economy, um, uh, we've got a typo here, are very much, get rid of the word we here. Inflation, the economy are very hard to predict. Don't invest based on the talking heads. Don't listen to uh, 
Jamie Dimon, don't listen to JP to uh, Lawrence Summers, don't listen to uh, David Solomon. These folks are changing their story every day or month based on what the economy is showing is producing. So they're not reliable predictors of anything. They're just uh, headline grabbers as far as I can tell, and they want to be on the news. Or maybe they have short positions they've taken and are trying to get everybody else to sell their stocks so they can make a killing. I don't know why you would make statements like a Hurricane Sandy is coming to the economy unless you're trying to talk the economy into recession. And that has happened. There's lots of psychology underlying recessions arising. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to stop there and turn things over to Jay. So Alex, let's see, we have to uh, share the screen with Jay now, right? Sure, let me make him the presenter. Okay, Jay, we see your face and you should be able to see your slides now. Excellent. Sorry that you have to see my face, but we'll, we'll, we'll have a little bit of that, a little bit of slides. Are they there, Alex? Looks, looks good to me. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Larry, and thank you, Alex. I'm gonna focus on um, the inflation component and then actually dive into the software about um, you know, how, it, how you can actually use it to model inflation and what we think the impact might be um, you know, on, on, an, on a, case, uh, a case study and, and give you some tools to apply this to your own situation. Um, so these things Larry touched on, um, but, but I'll say them kind of quickly here, is that Historical inflation, that is the change in the CPI, is, is historical. It's, it's, it's retrospective, right? So we've seen historical inflation spike, but really what matters, especially for planning, is, is what's going to happen in the future, okay? So markets, um, this is called the break-even inflation rate. Uh, the bond market, the difference between nominal treasury bonds and inflation-protected treasury bonds, that often called TIPS, the difference between the two is a market-based projection of what uh, inflation, kind of average inflation is expected to be over uh, kind of the next X years. So if we're looking at five-year treasury bonds, that would be what does the market project for, for the next five years of inflation? 30-year um, treasury bonds, um, what would be kind of long-run uh, average inflation? And so this is just to say that, yes, historically, CPI, you know, uh, CPI inflation has spiked, prices have gone up, but the market continues to project um, moderate muted inflation, um, you know, under 3%, both in kind of over the next five years and, and certainly over, over the long run. Okay, so when it comes to your financial plan, you know, how does inflation or how can inflation impact you and your plan? And yes, I'm a card carrying economist, so I have to say it depends. Um, well, what does it depend on? It depends on um, basically the flavor of your cash flows, uh, for example. So cash flows, you have income, you have expenses. Um, well, do those, do those cash flows, does that income and do those expenses tend to keep pace with or outpace inflation or not? Okay, so some some kind of typical examples of, you know, in income, wages typically keep pace with inflation, uh, obviously not always, but typically um, they do. Social security, um, we expect that those benefits are going to keep pace with inflation. Asterisks, I'll tell you more about that, that next. Um, investments. Yes or no. Uh, that kind of kind of goes beyond beyond the scope of this 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 talk mostly. Um, and then on the expenses side, right, we've got a whole bunch of expenses that typically keep pace with inflation living expenses, housing, healthcare related, for example, Medicare Part B premiums, which we'll talk about, schooling um, and, and taxes. Okay, so these things as inflation rise, we can expect that some, some income's gonna keep up with that and some expenses are gonna keep up with that, okay? Um, on the nominal side, right, there are, uh, there, there are some types of income that you might expect, particularly in retirement, things like pension income or annuity income. Um, Sometimes pension income uh, may keep pace with inflation. There may be a certain percentage that has a COLA, um, but in general, these things are kind of nominal income, right? So as Larry talked about with the Detroit example, if, if inflation goes to the moon, um, the, the, the annual check or monthly check that someone is getting from their pension or their nominal annuity, for example, is simply not 
going to uh, uh, be worth as much. The purchasing power of that income is going down, okay? Um, on the expenses side, one example is fixed rate debt. So the classic is a mortgage, right? If I'm paying a mortgage, it doesn't matter what happens to inflation, I'm gonna always pay that X dollars every single month, every single year. So in fact, having fixed rate debt as opposed to say variable rate debt actually can be um, a hedge against inflation, that the real value of that um, nominal expense is going to go down. You're paying back your mortgage and watered down dollars, okay? So this is just a picture of, um, of, what a, of what your financial plan or how your financial plan may be impacted by inflation. So depending on the flavor of these cash flows um, in your plan, that's how inflation um, uh, uh, may, may turn out. And this also gives us a sense of how you can go about protecting your plan against inflation, which we'll, we'll talk more about. Okay. So I, I put a couple asterisks, uh, you know, important notes here, social security, healthcare, taxes, and Larry mentioned this as well. This is really important um, and will show up in the software, is that taxes, Medicare Part B premiums, nor social security are fully indexed to inflation. I think for a lot of people that's surprising, um, but here's kind of the high level. Um, so taxes, as Larry had said, Uncle Sam doesn't really care what happens to inflation. If I earn 3%, um, and I and if I have a million dollars and I earn three percent, thirty thousand dollars. If I realize that as as taxable asset income, no matter what happens to inflation, I have to pay taxes on that thirty thousand dollars. So if inflation is three percent, the real return is zero, but I still have to pay taxes on that that nominal income, right? So if inflation goes up and the return, um, the nominal return on our on our assets over the long run keep up with inflation, for example, then we could be paying a lot more in taxes. Uh, Medicare Part B premiums, uh, the, the so-called IRMA, right? This depends on nominal, not real taxable income. If my taxable income, again, um, uh, asset income, if my assets keep up with inflation and uh, my, my taxable income goes up in retirement, I could very well be paying higher Medicare Part B premiums. Those are going to be based on uh, uh, based on income thresholds. Okay, similar um, thing with Social Security is that um, the thresholds have not been have not been indexed for inflation. They they have not changed since 1983, I think, as Larry mentioned. Um, so depending on what's called your combined income, which is essentially your adjusted gross income plus half of your Social Security benefit. Um, once that surpasses a, a, a very low threshold, um, you're going to start paying 50%. Uh, you're going to start paying taxes on 50% of that Social Security benefit. And then once it reaches another really low threshold, you're going to start paying 85% on that additional uh, Social Security benefit. Okay, that is not indexed to inflation. Um, the last thing that actually could be favorable um, for inflation, it really depends on the situation, is that Social Security counts nominal, not real earnings after age 60. This is kind of, you know, going into the weeds here a little bit, but um, basically if you're 60 uh, or older and you're still working, those earnings are going to count more so, relatively more so than if you were say 59, 58 or younger, okay? Just the way that social security calculates your average index monthly earnings, working, to, uh, working beyond age 60 actually pays more. So an example is, let's say inflation goes to the moon and your wages keep up with that inflation. Then working even for another couple of years can dramatically increase your social security benefit. So one takeaway is that, um, you know, if we do have sustained long-term inflation, returning to work um, looks good. In fact, it could look even, even, even better. Okay. Yeah, okay let me uh, add a couple points here. Uh, so yeah, going back to work after age 60 or working, continuing to work at, after age 60, you have this extra feature because the, as Joe said, those, those nominal earnings that you make are just entered, ranked against the earnings that were indexed up to age 60, your earnings before age 60 are indexed up to the year you're age 60, your earnings after age 60 are just entered nominally and then the whole thing is ranked from top to bottom, they take the 35 highest. So if you could, you know, uh, so you can potentially raise your real benefit because they're always recomputing your uh, your uh, Social Security benefit based on the highest 35 er years of earnings. So you could be working at 99 years old and still be raising your benefit above and beyond the COLA. So that's a good thing. The um, one little thing point I want to point out is that 
these thresholds of if you go, for example, and have some of you're beyond the the, uh, the top second threshold in Social Security, it's not that you lose 85% of your benefit. It's that 85% of your up to 85% of your Social Security benefit becomes taxable under the federal income tax as part of taxable income, and that's a big hit. But then the other thing I failed to mention with respect to um, older people and how they get hurt by inflation goes back to Social Security. Social Security index gives you your COLA with a lag. It's about a 15 month lag. So because we've had such high inflation and because people have had to wait so long to get this COLA that they're gonna get, I think it's gonna be like 8.7% in January. Well, that's nice to get, but it's coming in very late. So on average, um, uh, older people who are on Social Security have lost about 4% in real terms because of the delay in the COLA. The COLA should be done every month when you have high inflation. You shouldn't force people to wait. I mean, imagine we had 50% inflation this year and they decided they would adjust our benefits 30 years from now for that 50% inflation that was occurring this year. That would be worth nothing, right? That would be no adjustment. There's something like that going on here in the fact that we're having to wait really 15 months to get the COLA for the inflation that started 15 months ago, that's you know, going back 15 months. So you know, on average, again, uh, American retirees collecting Social Security have lost about 4% in real terms from inflation. We saw workers losing 8% in their real, real wages, Social Security recipients losing 4% real, roughly that number. Uh, so this has not been a fun time. I should also say college professors are not keeping up either. So anyway, Jay, keep going. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you, Larry. So some surprising, potentially surprising things, right? Taxes, Medicare, Part B, Social Security. Even if your plan is completely otherwise neutral to inflation, um, these things may not be, okay? So it's important to pay attention to that. So let's actually take a look at uh, Wanda Worker. Um, uh, kind of a hypothetical case study, right? She's single, she's age 65. Uh, we'll start with her being retired. She's planning to file for retirement, um, uh, you know, file for Social Security at her full retirement age. For her, that's gonna be 66 and a half. Uh, she has some pension and annuity income. I've modeled these the same way, just for illustration. Um, this is, this is um, nominal, so these are not, there's no COLA or indexing for, for either the pension or annuity income. She has a million dollar of million dollars of assets. For simplicity, I'm just going to assume that this is all kind of regular assets, basically taxable in taxable accounts, non-retirement accounts. Um, she has uh, she owns a home. It has ten thousand dollars of annual operating costs, and she has a hundred thousand uh, dollar mortgage. Okay, so let's take a look at what would happen with inflation. Um, but before we do, I want to point out kind of um, you know how how I would actually um, set up the different inflation profiles or scenarios in Maxify. Okay. So I would say you probably want to at least run a couple inflation scenarios. Uh, and the way that I've done this is I've said, well, hey, what if inflation, um, you know, is sustained at that 7%, which was kind of what it has been recently. And it's 7% for the rest of Wanda Worker's life throughout retirement. Um, that's kind of the yellow bar. Uh, here, sustained, sustained long-run inflation. Um, well, what if there's temporarily high inflation? Okay, so what if it's 7% for the next 10 years, and then it drops back down to what we might think of as a baseline? We'll use 3% as a round figure for kind of baseline inflation. Okay, so the orange, the orange scenario is temporarily high inflation, and then the base profile or baseline inflation we're going to say is, is 3%. Um, for the long run. But one quirk here is to point out that when you're modeling these scenarios in Maxify, it's really important to do a couple things. First, make sure that the, the inflation rate that you assume is the same in the first year. And, and to start, you should assume that the real rate of return, um, um, that is that the nominal rate of return equals the inflation rate. So essentially that your real rate of return um, um, uh, remains fixed. Okay, throughout throughout the uh, throughout the scenarios. So this or is the, how I've kind of teed up these profiles. Yeah, or that the differential stays. You could have like a sorry, the differential. Yeah, not the not the not that it has to be zero. Yeah. Yeah. So let me restate that. We want to assume that inflation is the same in the first year in all of these scenarios, and then we want to assume that the real rate of return, whatever that might be, 
whether it's zero, one, two, three, whatever you assume in your plan, that that real rate of return is, um, is the same. Okay. So actually, I'm going to pull up um, Alex and, and tell me if this is working here. Yep. Uh, looks, looks good to me. Okay. I'm logging in. It, lo yeah. it logged me out, so we'll see. I like you. Well, Jay's bringing that up. Let me just say a couple things uh, that occurred to me. One is, one is Jay uh, is working with our company to provide uh, co-piloting service for anybody who wants to use Maxify but would feel more comfortable having a, a PhD economist and certified financial planner take them through the program. We have a, a service that Jay uh, offers from our website. You just go to sign up and you can uh, see this the service. Uh, it's well worth it. You can buy a couple hours of Jay's uh, walking walking through entering the data and walking you through on analyzing the results and, and thinking about alternative simulations. And then the other thing is uh, just this point about uh, if you're trying to isolate the impact of inflation, you want to keep the real return fixed. So if you're assuming, for example, you're going to earn 3% uh, nominal and that the inflation rate was zero, that's an assumption we might have made a couple of years ago and earn 3% for sure on your assets. And now inflation's, at, you know, you're thinking it's going to be 6%, well, then you want to make your inflation rate 6%, but your nominal return 9%, so the differential stayed at 3% real. And then you could compare the two, the alternate profile with the, the base profile. And we have the program set up so that when you do that, comparison, uh, it's really apples to apples so that the alternative profile, the results are coming back out in the same dollars as in the base profile so that we're not showing you dollar amounts in the alternative profile that don't compare really in terms of how many hot dogs you can buy with what's going on in the base profile. So that's been a change we've made in recent months to make sure that you can run alternative profiles with different inflation rates and be able to compare them with the base uh, profiles inflation scenario and uh, and be really comparing apples to apples we're always trying to show in our software real things yeah yeah uh jay it looks like we got jay uh got you logged in here right yeah okay. you've got you can see my screen here okay great i we can um, yes Okay, perfect. So obviously not going to spend, we don't have enough time here to go through, you know, all the inner workings of Maxify, but I do want to show you within the software of how you can um, kind of manipulate the inflation and the return assumptions uh, kind of that Larry was was talking about. Um, so after you've kind of entered the information here for the client or for yourself, I'm sorry, um, in the settings and assumptions, the very first thing is, well, what do we want to assume for inflation? Okay, what do we want to assume for, for the nominal rate of return? Um, and And Again, as I mentioned earlier, the difference between the, the, the nominal rate of return and, and inflation is essentially the real rate of return. Okay, so if, if we assume that inflation is 7%, for example, and that the nominal rate is 7%, this was that sustained uh, high inflation scenario that, that, that we're gonna look at, then the real rate is, is zero. If we, if we say that uh, you know, the nominal rate is actually six, Seven minus six is pretty close to one. Uh, the, the, the math doesn't exactly work out to, to subtraction, but, but essentially, um, um, you know, six minus seven is, it would be negative one right here, okay? Um, but what we're saying is to start, you always wanna make that, um, um, you, you, you wanna keep this real rate of return the same across the scenarios, okay? So what I've done, I've already obviously set all these up. Um, what I wanna look at is, let's look at um, if we have temporary inflation. So this is a nifty thing here that you can model in, in, in Maxify as well as so you can say, well, will the inflation rate change? So I've said, well, hey, it's going to be 7% for the next 10 years, but then it's going to come back down to that 3% uh, inflation and 3% nominal. Okay, um, so we have temporarily high inflation, then it comes back to the baseline. Let's compare that to a situation where it's really just at that, at that baseline. So we're saying um, uh, temporarily high inflation versus essentially kind of baseline inflation. Um, if you click reports in Maxify, you can then run what are called comparison reports. We're going to compare these two here. Um, you run the report. And the very first thing that's going to show up is really 
the crux of economics based financial planning and Maxify, right? Everything come back, you've probably heard Larry say this a million times, is everything comes down to your living standard. Um, the software is solving for your highest affordable living standard. So that's really the focus here, um, whether we're looking at inflation uh, changes or, or you're making any other alternative profiles here, okay? So what we see is right off the bat that for, for Wanda Worker with, with 10 years of temporarily high inflation, in real dollars, right, in purchasing power, her, her living standard has gone down by about $3,700, it shows here, okay? Um, now, let's look under the hood. If you go back down, another nifty part of the software is, is the so-called lifetime balance sheet, um, which okay. sums up all of your current and future income. Yeah. Um, Jay, sorry, Larry. Yeah. Well, let's just go back to that slide for a second. I, I think you went a little bit quick, but uh, to the prior screen, or just go... Yep. Yeah, here. Um, so that's thirty-seven hundred dollars a year, right? Yeah, correct. I'm going to show all this. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, well, let's let him finish. Yeah, thanks. Right. Okay. Um, but so so yeah, we'll talk about the living standard. I've got that in my slides to compare it. Um, but looking under the hood uh, on the lifetime balance sheet is really interesting, right? Well, what's driving that? Okay, inflation has gone up. Um, uh, this is just rounding error. So social security, lifetime social security benefits for Wanda are about a million dollars, no matter what with inflation. That's pretty much what we would expect. Social security is going, going to keep up with inflation, um, but her pension has lost significant value. She's basically lost 30% of her lifetime value of her pension and her annuity. I modeled them the same way just for illustration um, because those dollars, that income that she's getting is not keeping up with um, um, with inflation. Okay, so she's getting paid in, in watered down dollars. She's lost $40,000 in real dollars on both her pension and her annuity. Um, an interesting thing here is that her housing expenses have gone down. Well, I modeled this just to show you that, that having a mortgage can actually be um, uh, a hedge against inflation. And I'm not going to go out and advocate that everyone should go um, get, you know, a really large uh, a fixed rate mortgage, especially with interest rates having gone up. But it is to say that that having um, uh, nominal expenses, including fixed rate debt, um, if inflation goes up really high, you're actually paying back that debt in watered down dollars. So in real dollars, um, my housing expenses or Wanda's housing expenses have gone down. But the big kicker here is taxes. Okay, so both federal uh, taxes and state taxes here for Wanda have gone up um, um, significantly. So she's going to pay $50,000 more in taxes over her lifetime and uh, in federal taxes and $20,000 uh, in, in state taxes. This can be driven by a couple things. We'd have to look under the hood to really tell, but primarily that asset income that she's receiving is in nominal dollars. Uncle Sam wants to get paid no matter what happens to inflation. Um, so even though we have the real rate of return being zero, she's still having to pay more in taxes with, with high inflation, okay? And that boils down to, to a lower living standard. So let me go back to my slide um, and hopefully get to kind of, um, I think what, uh, what Larry and Alex were, were hoping for is, is the focus on the living standard, okay? So if with temporarily high inflation, the living standard goes down by about 8%. If we have sustained high inflation, so for the rest of uh, Wanda's life, it stays at that 7% versus 3%, it's a 16% decline in her living standard. Um, and, and so again, this is hypothetical. It obviously depends on your situation, but inflation can really have a real significant impact on your, on your living standard. And I'll just restate, these are dollars that, that um, um, again, what is your living standard? It's how much you can afford to spend on, um, on your lifestyle, on your living standard, every year adjusted for inflation through the rest of your life without running out of money, okay? So her living standard has come down by 16% every single year for the rest of her life, not just for 10 years, not just for one year, but, but um, indefinitely, okay? So that's a significant impact. Okay, so what can we do about it? Um, just kind of going back to, um, you know, this, this slide here of, well, it depends on, on kind of the cash flows in your plan. Um, the idea is, well, we'd love to maximize, right? We would love to maximize um, uh, um, income that keeps pace with inflation, and we'd love to minimize the expenses that keep pace with inflation. So there's a variety of scenarios we could look at, but, but a couple come to mind and I think are interesting to look at is, well, we could certainly go back to work. Uh, or delay retirement, right? Any way that we can increase our lifetime wages could help. 
we would like to maximize our lifetime social security by optimizing that. Typically that means delaying um, filing till age 70 for, for most folks. Um, downsizing our home, even if, it, even if it's just to a condo, uh, from a single family to a condo that's essentially the same, the, same, the same price but has lower operating costs. We know those operating costs typically keep up with uh, inflation. So, so um, reducing those, those costs can help. And then something like maximizing um, um, uh, tax deferral. So by, by utilizing and optimizing tax advantage retirement accounts, for example, that may actually allow us to reduce um, taxes and therefore increase, um, increase our living standard. There, there, there are others. Okay, so here, here's, here's an example. I don't think I need to jump back into the software, but, but essentially what happens if Wanda um, delays her social security benefit to age 70, as opposed to filing at her full retirement age? Well, a couple things, right? She's, she's, she's going to, um, she's not gonna get three years of social security benefits, but when she actually starts receiving benefits at age 70, she's gonna, she's gonna essentially have a 24% increase in her, in her benefit for the rest of her life, just based off of how social security works. Okay, so delaying social security for Wanda can boost her living standards significantly. Um, and, and that's true across all of the inflation um, scenarios, the temporarily high inflation, the sustained inflation. She's getting a nine, 10 or 11% bump um, in her living standard every single year starting today through the rest of her life by delaying social security. Okay, and then another way to think about this is, well, what if we look at, at um, you know, kind of the change between, you know, ho holding her decision to file, file at age 70, for example, constant, but looking at the change in inflation, um, delaying social security can, can provide a, a further hedge against high inflation. So for example, if she is filing at age 70 and we, and, and we experience temporarily high inflation, Obviously, she's going to be worse off, 6% worse off, but she's less worse off than if she hadn't delayed Social Security. And the same is true for high sustained inflation. So delaying Social Security boosts your living standard and can provide a further hedge against inflation. It just increases your guaranteed floor of income in retirement. Um, Let's do let's do do one more and then we can save the rest for questions, I guess. But, um, uh, you know, what happens if you delay retirement even just for a couple of years? Um, these numbers become pretty significant. So if, if Wanda returns to work and she works for just two more years, um, uh, obviously she has two more years of earnings. But the interesting thing here is that as, as, Larry, as Larry talked about before, if Wanda returns to work, especially after age 60, depending on her earnings history, she could also um, um, significantly increase her social security benefit. So returning to work obviously means more income from working, more earnings, wages, um, and all the benefits that come along with that, but it could also pad her social security, okay? So we see that, that just working for two more years, she can, again, boost her living standard by about 10%, uh, and that's true across all of the inflation scenarios. Um, and then interestingly, this is a little bit kind of more detailed here, is that, um, um, it may further hedge against inflation. So the impact as you as you go, if I work two more years, if Wanda works two more years, you know, what's the impact if inflation goes up? Um, it may or may not have an effect. It really depends on if, if Wanda returns to work and can significantly increase her social security benefits, then 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 that could be um, a significantly uh, a significant improvement. But she might return to work and, and her social security benefit, depending on her earnings history, she really might not increase her social security all that much, which I think was the case um, for this here. So I don't know what, uh, if, we have, if we have some more time, I can hold off on these. I had a, I had a couple other case studies. Well, yeah, maybe we should go to Q&A, but I do want to kind of make the bottom line point of Jay's presentation, which is that yeah, if you go back to work, uh, if you delay taking Social Security, these things can can help offset what is a huge cost uh, to the elderly of inflation, potential to almost uh, most elderly. We're talking about a typical person who uh, is losing 16% of their, potentially 16% of their uh, uh, future living standard if we have high sustained inflation. And okay, 8% if we have 10 years of inflation at, at a high level, we're talking about 7%, that's kind of what could easily happen in this country. You know, we've seen a lot of variability 
and inflation has come down the last few months, but there's no guarantee it's not going to stay six, seven percent for a long time. Uh, and there's an enormous tax hike and a really benefit cut in terms of the delay in in the uh, COLA adjustment, how fast that occurs, uh, and also the fact that more of your Social Security benefits are subject to taxation and the top ceiling, the top um, threshold to the top bracket for Medicare Part B premiums, which are quite high. Uh, that top top bracket is, the other brackets are indexed for inflation, but the top one isn't, which means that everybody eventually is in the top bracket and that's being fixed. So more and more uh, people are paying the highest Medicare premium and that can be a nasty bite. So we have to realize that um, Uncle Sam is making money by making money. And if, if this is all happening because in part the government's been printing money, although I don't think that's really the reason, I think it's really just supply side shocks that have, because we've had inflation all over the world in, in the UK, in the Europe, European Union, it's about 10%, UK is about 14%. It's not due to uh, COVID checks, you know, causing inflation in Europe. Of course, they've had their own COVID checks, but but I, I think it's a, a global phenomenon connected to supply chain and issues and your, the Ukrainian war and China periodically cutting cutting back production. A lot is going on, but we have to be careful here because the basic message is a negative one that we're trying to convey here. Inflation means that you need to be very careful, more careful than you were previously about how much you spend. You have to plan cautiously for high inflation, and uh, that means potentially cutting back your spending, thinking about going back to work, being more diligent about thinking about maximizing your lifetime social security benefits, downsizing your home, moving to a state where they don't tax anything, any income, let alone your social security income. All these things are ways to adjust and, and Maxify can show you the value of each of these moves. So let's stop there, Alex, and open things up for Q&A and great presentation, Jay. Thank you.